Hello viewer, this is your first agricultural TV station on the nation, the Agricultural Research Council of Nigerian Television. My name is Joshua Ishaya, welcoming you to Special Report. Today on Special Report, we'll be looking at the just concluded 2023 Africa Stakeholders Conference on Food Security and Hospitality organized by the International Food Heroes Award, IFHA. The International Food Heroes Award 2023 will start safe food today for a better tomorrow. Hey, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you once again to Africa Stakeholders Conference on Food Security, Nutrition and Hospitality 2023. As a convener of this esteemed event, it is my honor to stand before you today. Our theme for this year's conference is Safe Food Today for a Healthy Tomorrow gaining perfectly with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 1, 2, 3, and 7. The goals represent our shared commitment to poverty eradication, achieving zero hunger, ensuring good health and well-being, and to also foster partnerships for sustainable development. It is with great pleasure it is with great pleasure that I extend my heartfelt welcome to all the distinguished men and women gathered here today. Our, we are present to reflect, reflect we are dedication and passion towards addressing the challenges of food security, nutrition and hospitality in Africa. Throughout the next few days, we will engage in thought-provoking discussions knowledge sharing and collaborative efforts to pave the way towards a higher future. That's to say, the conference is not going to end here. We are still going to engage it online with our online audience and community. Together, we will explore innovative strategies, best practices, and policy frameworks that will shape the trajectory of food security nutrition and hospitality in our great continent. I encourage each and every one of us to participate actively, share your expertise, and contribute to the rich tapestry of ideas and that will emerge from this conference. Let us seize this opportunity to foster lasting connections, exchange experiences, and ultimately empower our community our communities towards a healthier and more prosperous tomorrow i want to also use this opportunity to encourage all the farmers especially women and youths who remain very committed in feeding our continent it is possible and we have already shown showed that it is possible for us to make great impact. Uh, we cannot talk, tackle the issue of insecurity in the continent if we don't encourage our youth to go to the farm. The conference, which had experts from different walks of life, like farmers, chefs, policy makers, where this caution were strictly hitched on agricultural sector. We are putting in place to make sure that going forward as a youth, you can now be part of what we are doing, you cannot have access to national housing funds. The past DMD of a Federal Mortgage Bank, we intimated him on that at the presidential villa last year, and that is being worked on. So every Nigerian youth that is a farmer cannot be able to access national housing funds. That's one of the strategies. Strategy number two, you will be able to have access to be a pension, contribute to a pension scheme as well then have access to a health insurance uh, uh, scheme, which is the NHIS and all that. That Gora Healthcare and Health Insurance Company has put all that is needed for us. Now finally, on that incentive that we are looking at that can make Nigerian youth to come back to farming is this. From our program, a household is made up of six, father, mother, and four children. Each of this family, which we know on the first value before now, most farm, farm institutions, we pay 2,000 naira per day, depending on the farm work. 
So what we tend to do is that each family is translating to translate to one hectare. So each of that family will allocate one hectare, decide the particular crop, because we are focusing on food crops, fruits and vegetables and livestock. So one family farmer's household in the rural community will be allocated one hectare to cultivate the particular product. Let's say, for example, one hectare of okra. And if you translate it from 2,000 naira times six, that gives you about 12,000 naira in a day. Times a month, it gives one person 48,000. So in all, we are looking at 200 and something thousand. By the time you deduct relevant charges from the insurance scheme, uh, pension and tax. It will be the first time you see that Nigerians who are farmers will not pay a huge tax under our management structure to the federal government. Uh, can you understand from the team? We are all educated and we all know what the country is turning into before it used to be programs centered on food insecurity. When there was crisis, when there was a lot of bloodshed in some part of the country, when the food were not enough because of lack of securities in one place or the other. But right now we are talking about food security. And the second the last speaker who came here has already defined, no, the last speaker, the madam from the NAFTA, shall define what we mean by the food security. Now we are also talking about agriculture. I want to commend President Bola Ahmed Sudoku. For the first time in the history of this great country, for appointing somebody to serve as the Minister of Agri and Food Security. If you don't know it, I want us to know this thing that food is an essential tool of life. People are taken to streets, people are doing a lot of things because of food. And if we must ensure that our food is secured, we have a lot of food in our community, in our environment, in our nation. It shouldn't be left with only the development partners, you know, people from the Ministry of Agri, people from the Ministry, people from the NAFTA. No, it's a collective responsibility for all of us. As we are seated here together today, we can still go back home and ask ourselves questions. What can I do to support this initiative? What role can I play? Let me tell you something, no matter how big and how small you are, we have a responsibility to participate, to contribute to our own quota, to ensure that we live a better life for our people. I gave the vision a deep philosophical thought and subjected it to a focused analysis of the policy process for agriculture and food security, whereby it was found that a better tomorrow for Nigeria can only be attained if and only if through the philosophy of freedom, particularly freedom from all forms of hunger and malnutrition, for that matter. That is a situation in this country in which everyone is able and capable of obtaining is or are rightful entitlements to safe and nutritious food at all times, including now and tomorrow. The background to this quintessential research question, which I asked myself a long time ago, about policy implementation, that is, why do policies fail repeatedly at implementation stage to achieve food security in Nigeria? My investigation of this problem reveals that the perennial failure of government programs and projects in agriculture is deeply rooted in the governance failure itself. That is to say, governance failure that is failure of government, is in itself the precursor of policy failure in agriculture, which is characterized by lack of voice and accountability in the policy process. 
government ineffectiveness, political instability and violence, absence of the rule of law and uncontrolled corruption in our country. Therefore, we need a special purpose vehicle to deal with both governance failure and policy failure. As a single inseparable challenge militating against agriculture and food security of Nigeria, of West Africa, and of Africa at large. The forceful removal of farmers from their farms, farmland, by the question of bandit and S-men, the quest for better life, especially by our youth, has led to decrease in workforce in the agricultural productivity, crude equipment. From the paper, from this paper, a major challenge in the use of, of the, is the use of local and crude equipment, such as hose and collagen, which amounts to back-breaking labor and sweat. This translates into poor harvest. The poverty prevalent among our farmers did not present from them the opportunity of deploying modern-day farm equipment, such as tractors, implements and inputs, such as fertilizers, improved seedlings, etc. In the southwest, farmlands are thick forests which need proper land clearing and preparation. What you call land clearing is not land clearing at all. What you call farmland are not farmland. When, we, when you plant on the kind of farmland that we have today in Nigeria, you have stones inside the earth, you have thorns and thistles and weeds. They compete with your farm yield. In Indonesia, an hectare of land will produce close to 40, 40 tons of cassava. But in Nigeria, here, because your farm contained with not well prepared land, with stones, with weeds, and all the other things, they yield just about 15, 15 tons of cassava. I've analyzed the problem we face today. Meaning that we cannot meet with our food needs. And because of the lack of our food needs, it has created opportunity. Nature allows vacuum. Where there is vacuum, nature fronts at it. Where Nigeria cannot feed our people, they become a dumping ground for countries that are self sufficient in their food needs. Who will look for other countries that need them or where to dump them? Yam is a stable food that is common in Nigeria. Especially in Benue, in the Middle West, in the Southwest, and in the South South. Ewedu is a Nigerian green vegetable for our soup. Great with amala, white or black. Pumpkin leaf, also known as fugu, is a vegetable in the Igbo people of South Southeast. As we speak, the Chinese are importing China yam into Nigeria and they are contending with the Nigerian yam in African stores in the US and in the UK. Ugu, Ugu is now grown in Vietnam and is being imported into Nigeria. So when you buy your Ugu in the market, you wouldn't know whether you are eating Nigerian Ugu or the one grown in Vietnam and I'm very very serious about it. So also is Ewedu. Ewedu is grown in Egypt. And it's being, it's being exported to UK. You think that when you eat Amala in Canada, you think the Wedu is from Nigeria? No. Egypt has farm that grows the Wedu. Vietnam has Ugu. They export to African, African markets in the UK. A few years ago, the Chinese made an attempt to import Gary into Nigeria. I don't know if they succeeded. One thing is certain. The Indonesian who took our seedling are exporting palm oil into Nigeria. I hope you know. Therefore, this is a clarion call for our local corporate farmers to enter into collaboration to help fight and wage war on food security, insecurity. Food insecurity is worse than external aggression. A country who cannot feed a citizen will implode with their consequence. Let me draw your attention before I close my paper. The positive of agricultural logistics. 
On our farm, we need good roads. Our farmers, when they harvest what they need, they leave the rest of their harvest either on the trees, either they, they leave it under the ground, where where we termites we eat them, or thieves will come and eat them at night to carry the rest. We need silos in Nigeria. This is where we, we are we are looking at towards Nigeria, investing in agriculture. There are too much wastages, no silos, no modern day pan, and the rest of them. So when the farmer uses what he wants, they leave the rest at the mercy of other elements. The conference hide a highly discussion and interactive session on the problems the Nigerian agricultural sector is facing today and the way forward. The discussion session was moderated by Funke Obafemi of the Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria. Take a look. The truth is that we have policies. Problems we have is not paucity of policies. Everybody is a head in government, professors, doctors, and all that. They seem to have good policy, but then also the implementation is a major issue. Forums like this are many. A lot of people started from government in the past. They have sat down, they know the issues. They even know the problems to, to solve it, the solution. But the political will, for example, the Zafaristi government is accusing the federal government of negotiating with the bandits. The federal government is accusing the officials of the state that they are talking behind them. And how do you know how you negotiate with bandits to allow farmers to go to the farm? With all the arsenal, we talk about the external aggression about people coming to invade your country. Whereas there are people in your country that are giving you issues and you know how to all you need to do as a commander in chief of the armed forces is to say, no, all is, is God. Go after. Once you can solve the problem, first and foremost of insecurity. There are many farmers with guitar hands and legs. There are many of them in IDP camps. Yeah, yeah. Once you can solve the problem, that people can now return. I had a farm somewhere in Laju, in Oyo State. I was confronted by cattle rearers. And I called to and I told my wife that. Because I have a food using plant in Ibadan, and I bought a thousand acres of land to feed my curry plant, cassava. But I was threatened. That was after the aftermath of the slaughter of the daughter that came from the US. He was slaughtered like a cow on his farm. For me, I don't want to die. My children are very young. My wife said, You are not going back to that farm. That is a tree killed, a thousand acres of land. That turned back into a forest. After deploying my D7 to clear my land and deploy my. So, what are we talking about? The government have to come and have a strong political will to back up their promises and activate it to the common good of Nigerians. We should not hide information. True. Um, there was somewhat some level of uh, withdrawal of the actual situation, the gravity of anthrax, as it were, mm. to the general public. Mm. Um, an animal affected with anthrax, I should guess we are over a hundred here. It wow. has um, the ability to kill all of us, just an animal. Yes, with anthrax. And we had God knows how many, number, like hundreds of thousands. These were animals that came in through porous borders uh, due to lack of government uh, regulatory regulation. Uh, so I just want to be very careful with words but then uh, we have to be very intentional True. how safe are animals um, at the level of the FCT and I would like to say for a fact blow our own trumpets that we are trying very hard to make sure that livestock that goes out there is relatively is wholesome for consumption. But again, there's just so much we can do. Niger State, Nasara, Laskaru, and Lokoja are just neighboring states 
that may not have the facilities we have, and these guys come in on daily basis. So we have a lot of chefs and cooks here. I would like to suggest that uh, we be very careful what we feed uh, our customers because 60% of our diseases come from animals, animals and animal products. So if you buy fish from perhaps somebody that uh, indiscriminately uses antibiotics, you're causing, you're adding to what the FAO and the WHO term as the next pandemic, which is antimicrobial resistance. You say getting a reliable bias, product sourcing and quality, exchange rates, logistics, bad books. And like Professor said, these things are governed by policies. But the policies are not put in use. You go to offices, you want to get documents, it's a whole lot of fun. Like you are begging to get the document. Somebody is trying to get a, a Nigerian product and they want them to come and help them certify this thing. They tell you, go and get a big house, set up a factory. Somebody that is trying to just build a business. How do they even get money to get a factory? They tell you, come to the office and get this certificate. You are going there. The secretary from the door is not even friendly. And we, I always say, we have enough food. You go to country and you are seeing your product, they are calling it Ghana Yam. They are calling your, your product. You go, you, go to, you go abroad, you go to Germany, you go to US, you are seeing your Pahoya and they are giving it a foreign name. They come here, use this same policy that is not working for us. I don't know how they do this thing. But if there is a way this policy can work for a common businessman and a woman, it will be fair. Our roads are bad. Bad roads. You see, you go to you go to places, you go to Kaduna, you go to Kano. Even interstate trade is even hard. Not talk about exports. Like something I, I recently started doing. I was even telling some people, I said, let's even forget this export thing. Let's do interstate trade. You go to Kano, there's a lot of grains. Ibada has one of the a lot of poetry. They don't have grains. Kano does not have palm oil. I will see palm oil waiting in a quiet one and better state. So what are we saying? And by the time you do your calculations, logistics is eating our profit. Ella says the truth. The solution is, is in our hands, right? It's in our hands as a nation. I'd like to um, talk about the collaboration impact. You know, uh, I think Professor Matthew Dr. Matthew Pio, you talked about um, the collaboration thing when Nigerians will go with goods and they come back with nothing. And they come to our country, they go with a lot of things. Yes. So I want to ask, how has collaboration helped? Are we really enjoying collaboration or we are actually killing ourselves by waiting on the UN to come and save us? Thank you very much. Thank you. The, the issue we have is the terror of Nigerians on Nigerians. Okay. It's an internal thing. You know when your skin is white, the, the Chinese man, the Indian man, the Lebanese man, the Vietnamese man, they know how to play the game because they are playing international markets. You are doing local. Any, any cost, any value will cost above the cost of production will not work out for you. So you cannot factor in corruption. Corruption does not have percentage. They could demand 100 percent from you. When timber, teak, mahogany was banned for export, the Chinese were doing it 100 percent. You know, Shobo, in Ibadan, everywhere. They don't allow as a, as a black man. In fact, when you buy, when they, when they, when you buy a lorry load of timber, the Chinese man is ready to buy from you because you will export one thousand and one containers. In a GP, yes. because you already factor because it's any dollars you are doing local. Yeah. So it's like that. So collaboration with who? Is it collaboration with, with your government or with, with partners and others?
Do you want to share more light on that? What has collaboration? I wanted to speak from the angle of um, the benefits, because truth, truth be told, there are some collaborations that are working, and there are some that aren't working, right? There are some that are political, uh, they have political undertone and all. So I wanted to speak from the angle of what possible collaboration are we not exploring at Pan-African level? I was opportunity to be in an African Center for Disease Control training outside of Abuja. I just returned yesterday. Okay. And um, it was uh, organized by the African Union where uh, it was it's a tripartite training sort of. Uh, where um, human doctors, uh, environmentalists, and veterinary doctors come together under the One Health umbrella. So as One Health um, enthusiasts, uh, we bring human health, animal health, and the environment as it were. Let me just give a simple scenario where collaborations actually work. Uh, I'm a veterinary doctor, the, I am a, a livestock merchant, I go get plants for my livestock. But then the farmer that grew these grasses, perhaps because of fear of low cost, decides to use pesticides. Use pesticides on your hay mm -hmm. and uh, I buy them to feed to my livestock. Mm -hmm thereby depositing organophosphates. Human beings, I mean, uh, here in Africa, how we measure social status is by how much meat you have on your plate. We go and generously buy these meats without proper inspection. We put this meat on our tables, and we're big men with our kids, and we feast. Now, if we, we of course, we know the dangers inherent you know, kids start coming down with diseases like asthma, you know, even cancer, you know. Uh, you have um, uh, a marriage ceremony and then you do some bokoto, a lot of pomo, you know. And you didn't know that they used tires to roast this high. Now, uh, when you come to One Health, everybody is a stakeholder, including communication. Yeah. You know, I know this, you know this. Mm -hmm. One of the ordinary person out there. Yeah. You know, so there's need collaborations, okay. So for this uh, empowerment or uh, the workshop I went to, were paid in dollars. Directors were there and they were saying for the first time in about 33, 34 years in the civil service, they went for a program that they got, even outside the country, that they got paid in hard currency. What does that translate to? The African Union, of course, came in, worked with the National Center for Disease Control, Federal Ministry of Environment, and Federal Ministry of Agri, but they were in charge of dispersing the funds. That is, there, there was a salient message that we are not honest people, we are not sincere people, we are not disciplined people, so as much collaborations as we like to think we should have would not be so fruity if we don't tell ourselves the truth. We must be very sincere and approach between ourselves and amongst ourselves. On that note, we come to the end of the African Stakeholders Conference on Food Security and Hospitality organized by Food and Heroes Award IFHA. My name remains Joshua Isha. Thank you for being a part of it. Have a safe and wonderful day ahead. Bye for now.